Good morning. I have to tell you, after many years of uh, being at another church and then being unable to get to church, Connie Stanley is here with us this morning. She is our second oldest uh, member, and because her, well, she's moving to Florida with her daughter. Jane, we're glad that you're here with her this morning and made it so that she could come. Uh, they will stay for the coffee hour, so make sure that you have a chance to speak to them. Let us worship God together. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Is, your, is this truly your heart's cry to dwell in the presence of the Lord? Let it be true and let us worship him. Receive our worship, O oh God. We are so grateful to be in your presence today. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Let us sing, I give myself away.
Let us pray. The promise of the Holy Spirit is that he will show us the truth of God's word and lead us into understanding. For this we pray, O oh God. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures. May they be fresh and alive to us today, renewing our spirits and showing us how to be more like your son. Jesus, give us a desire for your word and a love for its truth. Help us to hear what you are speaking through your servant and to follow with joy and obedience. We look forward to digging deeper into your holy words. We pray as Jesus taught saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Psalm 65, what mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you. For you enter our prayers, all of us must come to you. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. What joy will you choose to bring near those who live in your holy courts? What festivities await us inside your holy temple? You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. You take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep, and the valleys are carpeted with grain. 
they all shout and sing for joy. It has been quite a week since we saw you last Sunday. It's been filled with us. This week we are going to take it a little bit easier. Today will be the uh, 250th anniversary committee meeting after coffee hour. Uh, for November, we're really having multiple uh, mission events. One of them is our White Cross uh, gifts for uh, South Providence Neighborhood Ministries. The sign-up sheet is taped to the wall behind the door on this side as you enter the narthex. There are cards downstairs to sign for uh, Halloween. Uh, cookie walk, flour, sugar, unsalted butter, walnuts, pecans, and as the list grows, you will share it with us that we may share it with others. Cooking has started. It will shortly. That's why it's time for us to bring in ingredients so that we can make these pounds of cookies. And November 15th, the lasagna dinner will be at 6 p.m. to do the kickoff for our 250th anniversary. That day, we will be 249 years old. For our children's time this morning, I was planning on a one-time possibility. But all of you are sitting together in the front pew, and I don't know if it's going to work as well as it was going to when you were in different positions, because I was going to have one run one way and one run the other way. It's the only time you have permission to run in the church. Do you want to do that? Decide how you're going to go, and then come meet me up here. Because we're waiting for you. You don't stay at the back, you have to run to me. Yay, Sydney. But do you know what? It did not matter what route you took or how fast you got here. The concept was you had to get to me. Just as Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what path you take, it doesn't matter how, who gets there first, what order you get there, as long as you get to Jesus Christ, then you're okay. Now, as part of our Children's Day thing, I believe you're going to do something special for us. Hello everyone. Our Sunday School class is actually going to show you um, a modern day version of our skit called Mary and Martha. Jesus had two friends. Their names were Mary and Martha. They were sisters who loved Jesus very much. Both of them loved him in their own way. Jesus knew that. But when he came to visit, he told them which one loved him the way he wanted to be loved. 
Mary, come and help me set the table. I can't do all this work by myself. Yes, Martha. I'm glad Jesus is coming to visit today. Do you think he'll want some figs and grapes? Jesus always likes our food. And do you think he'll want some bread to eat? Maybe. I think I hear footsteps outside. That must be him. Good, Jesus. Sit down, Jesus. Oh. <sighs> Mary, what are you thinking of? How you teach us more and more every time you come. Thank you, Mary. I remember the things I teach. Oh, yes, I think about them all the time. That's all she ever does, Jesus. Think and dream all day long. I wish you would help me with the m work more. I spent all morning long making a nice meal for you. Tell her to help me, Jesus. Martha, I always love coming here. I know how hard you work, but when Mary sits at my feet listening to my words, she's, she is doing the right thing. I didn't come here for a meal. I came because I want to teach both of you my word. And I'll sit down and listen to Good, now I can teach both of you. I know I know both of you love me. That is why I come to visit and tell you God's word. When Jesus came to visit, Martha learned the best thing was to listen to what Jesus had to say. And see. We also want to uh, present you with certificates. Sydney, Niasia, Lexi, Lindsay. Oh, Johnny, would you come up now, please? And today, Johnny will start being a teacher of the older girls. So they are going to get certificates of promotion to the next level. But Sydney, you're not left out because you are a good reader now. We're giving you your own Bible that you can take home and look at at home. Thank you, guys. You did an excellent job on your skit. Not through? OK. Hold on, we're not done yet. I'm not done. Uh, God made teachers who teach by their deeds and not by what they say. Who helps students learn truth to choose right from wrong, to embrace wisdom, and to grow in understanding by being them, them, being for them a living lesson for God's text work and life? And I'd like to say, I am so so appreciated of our wonderful teacher we had all year. And this is from the church, and, and this is from your kids, Lexi and Asia. Thanks again. O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. If the ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings.
gifts and we offer our prayers, not trusting in our own righteousness, but as those who know our own unworthiness, but trust only in your love and your grace. Keep us from any temptation to see ourselves as better than someone else, remembering that as you loved us all so much that you gave your only son as the price for our redemption. Help us to see in Christ our mediator, the way to love you and all your children more fully. We pray in Christ's holy name, amen. Let us sing together, lead on, O King Eternal. Scripture reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. The people say, Our wickedness is caught up with us, Lord, but help us for the sake of your own reputation. We have turned away from you and sinned against you again and again. O hope of Israel, our Savior in times of trouble, why are you like a stranger to us? Why are you like a traveler passing through the land? stopping only for the night. Are you also confused? Is our champion helpless to save us? You are right here among us, Lord. We are known as your people. Please don't abandon us now. So this is what the Lord says to his people. You love to wander far from me and do not restrain yourselves. Therefore, I will no longer accept you as my people. Now I will remember your, all your wickedness and will punish you for your sins, the sins this reading.
Hear our prayer, O Lord. God. You desire to fill us with good things, to share your abundant life with us, to pour out your spirit upon us. You give us a gift of your presence. You lavishly grace us with your mercy and your forgiveness. Your resurrection power is available to us always. Your words speak to us of, of your purposes and your will. Your prophets, old and new, proclaim your message of love and healing. Despite all the ways you reach out to us, we often turn aside. We are busy. We are distracted. We are unwilling to give up the lordship of our own lives. When we reap what we have sown, we have the audacity to complain and point the finger of blame. Yet all the while, you never stop inviting us to listen to your voice, to return home, to be restored in your loving embrace. Thank you for your long-suffering patience, for being with us an immovable rock of salvation and for your love, which is everlasting. Lord, we lift before you Gina this morning. We pray that you would be with her and bring her to health. We are grateful this morning to have Connie and Jane worshiping with us as they have the experiment of living together again after so many years of living apart. We pray that you would continue to bless them and make this an easy transition. Lord, we have been asked to pray for the Red Sox, and I'm sure you enjoy the games as well. We give you thanks for all of your good gifts to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us sing together, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder.
I had an announcement that I forgot. I have asked in the past for you to turn in names and contact information for those who have had a relationship with our church. It's getting down to the wire. We really need to write a letter by the first week of November. And since Friday is November, we really need, the, they can come by email, they can come on a piece of paper, they can come verbally if they need to be, but I do need names and addresses of people who have been a part of the church so that they can know about our 250th events and hopefully attend some of them. Our scripture text this morning is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for the Gentiles to hear and he rescued me from certain death. Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. We know that like next week's New York City's marathon, races are popular. But what about a marathon that goes vertical? Tower running is a hot new way to run and can teach us a lot about finishing the race of the Christian faith. The starting gun in the New York City Marathon will fire next Sunday morning as runners from around the world will begin the 26.2 mile race through the streets. Bearing some change in plans due to the bombings at the Boston Marathon in April. But every effort will no doubt be made to ensure a safe event for the runners of one of the world's most famous marathons. Some of the runners will race for the prize, while others will consider a respectable finish to be a great accomplishment. But while running a marathon is still a popular bucket list, Connie's here because this was on her bucket list to worship with us. I like that bucket list better. It's a popular bucket list for many people other regular marathoners believe that running such a long horizontal distance again and again over time can really beat up the body. Not to mention the fact that logging mile after mile on the course can get kind of monotonous. An increasing number of those runners, in fact, are becoming less interested in hoofing it through the streets and more interested in the buildings that tower over them, buildings that contain miles of stairs within their dizzying heights. Welcome to the sport of professional stair climbing. Christine Fay is a 29-year-old environmental scientist who turned to stair climbing, also known as tower running, after qualifying for the Boston Marathon 10 times and running a bunch of others. She turned to vertical racing after a friend encouraged her to try it. And she became hooked on running up the stairs instead of pounding the pavement. Kristen is now the best female US athlete in the sport and recently ran a groundbreaking 24 
hour endurance event in Jacksonville, Florida, where she and three fellow climbers repeatedly scrambled up the Bank of America's towers 42 floors. By the time they were finished, they had logged 1,023, 480 steps and 5,880 floors. The equivalent of scaling Mount Everest two and a half times, but not as cold. She runs up most of the tall buildings in the United States, including the Sears Tower in Chicago and the Empire State Building. Most of us would consider running 5,880 floors to be insane. After all, that's what elevators were created for, right? Kristen says that the recovery time for running after all those stairs, mostly two at a time, is longer than that of a marathon. Sometimes, she says, I'll feel sick for two or three days afterwards. A few times I've tasted blood near the top of a race and I've seen spots in some races when I have just five floors from the top. Once I pass my timing mat, I usually fall and will crawl out of the other people's ways trying to catch my breath. I've stumbled when my legs are jelly, but I have never fallen, and I've gotten blisters on my hands from grabbing the rails, so I bought football gloves to protect the skin. And you thought that walking those three floors was bad? 500, no, 5,880 floors in one day. The point is, vertical running can be tough, but it's also a great way for all of us to achieve good health, a sense of satisfaction, and a stronger desire to keep moving. It can help us keep going in the race of life. You get the sense from reading Paul's letter to Timothy that he's sort of feeling like a tower runner having climbed too many steps to count as he traveled all over the Roman world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had certainly had his own share of blisters, falls, scrapes, and blood from a myriad of beatings and imprisonments. But now, as he stands at the top of the vertical race that his life was as an apostle, Paul realizes that the race was all worth it. I've fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, he says. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. For Paul, the race was always vertical because it was always focusing upward on Christ. In Philippians 3.14, he puts it like this, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call in Jesus Christ. To the Colossian Christians, he writes, so if you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Paul spent most of his life traveling long horizontal distances, but he was always looking up toward a higher calling and a prize worth racing toward step by step by step. He didn't get there like that. It took him time, it took him energy, it took him beatings. Indeed, it was the focus on the prize awaiting him at the top of those steps that kept him going, along with the constant steps of the Lord walking with him, giving him strength, rescuing him from the lion's mouth, and saving him for the heavenly kingdom. Paul is writing all this to his young protege, Timothy, and the text implies that Timothy will be the next one to pick up the baton that Paul is passing to him and to continue the long climb of following Christ. All who want to give a, live a godly life 
in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, Paul tells him. But he encourages Timothy to continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. There will be opposition from those who want to take the shortcut or the easy way up. But Paul says, as for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. In other words, keep on climbing higher and higher. Following Jesus isn't just about waiting for some catalogical elevator that will take us to heaven someday. It's about the hard work of climbing step by step toward the goal of what Paul elsewhere calls the prize. Those steps are taken in devotion, worship, service, compassion, and justice. Steps we take every day that lead to help for us, hope for others, and the renewed health of God's good creation. We are each called to pick up the baton and continue the vertical race toward that crown of righteousness. How do we do that? What training tips can we use for the climb? Here are a few from Kristen and others who run the vertical race for fun. Keep running up. Very few tower runners have the nagging injuries of marathoners, so long as they keep running up. Running down the stairs, on the other hand, can lead to a wide variety of injuries and potential for falls. The effective Christian climber gains strength by always focusing upward, staying in God's word, lifting our hearts up in prayer, lifting others up through service, the daily discipline of looking up through cultivating our relationship with God and serving others helps us to keep moving toward that finish line one step at a time. Use the rails. The best tower runners like Kristen use the handrails to to their advantage, grabbing the rail and pulling themselves up like yanking on a rope. The rails provide a helping hand that gets the runner to the next level. We might think of the church community as acting like those rails, encouraging others to keep moving, pulling them up when they are sagging and strengthening each other after the climb. Even the strongest will sometimes need something or someone to lean on. Paul recounts that most of those who had traveled with him had deserted him by this time in his life, except for Luke. Paul asked Timothy to bring Mark with him, for he is useful in my ministry. Paul understood that the church is to be the support for every individual to hang on to as he or she runs that race. How is our church encouraging others and helping them climb to new heights in Christ? In addition to the list that I read earlier on the ways that the church can help, another thing that you can do when you're not with your church family that will strengthen you is listening to good music. Making your movie choices something that will build you up instead of scare you to death or tear you apart. It's all about finishing well, not who finishes first, not who did the longest run, but who finishes well. The point of every race is to finish. Some will finish faster and stronger than others, but everyone who undertakes a race does so to do their very best. We know that tower running is becoming popular because it's something anyone with good knees can do even if they'll never be as fast as Kristen. In fact, tower running is never about racing against your opponent. All tower runners compete against themselves and the clock, doing their best to finish the race in their own best time. 
I was talking to one of the people from G20 Chorus this week, and he said that they are not competing in the Northeast section to be the best. They're competing against themselves to do better than they did the year before. And that's what we need to do. It may not be every day, but however slow or fast our steps are, the next step, take it a little bit stronger than the last step. The vertical race of following Jesus is about doing the best that we can. It's not about comparing ourselves to others, but encouraging each other to do the best that we as a group can in running the race to achieve the prize, the upward calling of God in Christ. Now, you may not be running the New York City Marathon next week, but you can take the stairs tomorrow when you do Think about those who race to the top and about how you can keep moving toward the best prize ever. And if you can't take the stairs, you see stairs or you see an elevator. Think about that movement toward the best prize ever. Let us pray. We are weak, but Jesus is strong. Lord, we pray that you would be with us, yourself, your spirit, and your people to help us move step by step closer to what you have called each of us to be and do individually. And we pray that you would be with us as a church as we enter our 250th year of work, as we celebrate, we pray that in all of the events, others would be able to see your work here. Because we haven't been here 250 years personally, but you have been here every moment of the time. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us do our climbing with our voices. We are climbing Jacob's ladder.
error on your part and weary souls. When the wind blows, listen for God's whispers. When the sun shines, bask in the glory of a great God who loves you. And when darkness falls, look up, for there you will see the stars and know that there is beauty even in darkness. And now in the presence of God, he is all around you. You are never alone. Amen. Amen. Um.